Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Dina Beard. I'm the director of the lab and the lab is in San Francisco and um, it sits on Ramaytush Ohlone land. We send our gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land for generations. The only point of the lab is to provide real material support for artists. So we give a few artists each year up to $100,000, keys to our space, and the option to revise any and all aspects of our operating model. This is a provocation, but it's also definitely part of the, the material support we provide to artists. Um, we do have these one-off programming programs in the midst of this as well, and we use these um, these one-off programs as ways to redistribute money to artists as well. So our current commissioned artists are playwright Asher Hartman, poet Tongo Eisen Martin, and dancers Jose Abad and Keith Hennessy. The work we do is entirely supported by our community. So please consider signing up as a member or making a donation on our website. 100% of the money that you donate will go to artists as does 48% of the lab's budget. So we, we devised these forums as a way of responding directly to this weird moment and to share ideas across many different social and geographic contexts. And this means that we really need you, the audience, to help us make sense of all the ideas that are put forward by artists and activists during these conversations. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any questions after the talk. So if you're watching on YouTube as well, you can, you can send in your questions through the comments screen and we will try to get to those as well. So our next forums will be with, it will be in the new year with historian Gerald Horn in conversation with Tongo Eisen Martin, artist and activist Carolyn Lazard and the architect E.L. Weissman. So we're very excited for those. This will be in January and February and I'll start putting them up on our sites shortly. But today I'm so, so glad to have Candace Hopkins and Raven Chacon with us. Um, they're joining us from Albuquerque. So very, very thrilled um, to have them with us. I'm continually inspired by both of your work. It's just um, been a touchstone for me for the past, I don't know, five years at least. Um, Candace is originally from Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory and is a citizen of Carcross Tagish First, First Nation. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. She was a senior curator at the 2019 Toronto Biennial of Arts and worked on the curatorial teams for the Canadian Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennale and Documenta 14. Her writings on history, art, and vernacular architecture have been published widely. <laughs> and Raven, Raven is also a, Raven is a composer, performer, and artist from Fort Defiance, the Navajo Nation. His work ranges from chamber music to experimental noise to large scale installations, produce, producing solo and with the indigenous art collective Post Commodity. And we were, I mean, Raven's, Raven's performed at the lab at least two times that I know of. I mean, plenty of times. <laughs> so very happy to have you back, even if it's virtually. So with that, I'll hand it over to you both. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we're thrilled to be here. And uh, we're going to share a presentation with you and we'll kind of go back and forth. Um, it's really centered around some thinking leading to a new score uh, that we generated um, that was first published as one of the dispatches uh, for Liquid Architecture, uh, who started a journal and they're based in Melbourne, Australia. We have no ear lids. We are condemned to listen. These are the opening lines of composer Armory Schaefer's essay called Open Ears. And while we can't close our ears, it doesn't mean that we listen to everything that's being said. And that's particularly the, true for those whose ears often seem more closed than they are open. One of the questions that we're thinking about is how we might attune ourselves to pick up different frequencies, how we might feel what reverberates or what sounds at the margins, what might be a decolonial or even a non-colonial way of listening. The Stalo scholar Dylan Robinson 
says that this is necessarily an intersectional action, one that takes place both bodily and ideologically. He also asks how we might tune out the colonial subfrequencies that constantly hum in our ears and hear or listen beyond them, beneath them, where we might even be able to hear another future aside of them. Indeed, one of the missing components of discourses on decolonization might be the practice of deep listening, a term that was best known or aligned with the late composer Paulina Oliveros. I think sometimes in the visual arts, we're so conditioned by our eyes that we've all but forgotten our ears. Many of our minor voices sing out into the void, but this void is not truly a void. As people like Anishinaabe scholar Dolene Manning says that if we listen, harmonics are everywhere. If we can only tune in, this includes the things like harmonics of the stones, which are considered grandmothers and grandfathers. For Dene, they're even gods. This includes the harmonics of the leaning trees that always reveal the direction of the wind. This might also include the harmonics of the water that is host to another world of beings powerful even today. I've been opening my ears and this is what's sounding at the margins. And it's a chorus that's becoming louder by the day. It's a collective of minor voices filled with major players, a peripheral ensemble perhaps, but we practice every day. We condition our vocal chords and we're finding our tune. It might sound to some like a cacophony, but even noise is generative. As Fred Moten and Stefani Harney write in the Undercommons, they say that the cacophony is extra musical. We hear something in them that reminds us that our desire for harmony is arbitrary. So in other words, listening to cacophony and noise tells us that there is a wild beyond to the structures we inhabit and that also inhabit us. So I'm asking, what is the sound of the sovereign? Is it here among us now? Is it me speaking to you? Is it me trying to listen to you beyond this digital divide? One of the definitions of music that Raven has brought to me is this idea that it might just be beauty aligning with other beauty. It might just be the universe reminding you that is listening to you. It might just be the idea of repeating sounds or overlapping sounds, a ceremony of sound that might break the spell or the convention of time that we've been forced to adhere to. Music is the basis for every ceremony, just as art is the basis for every ritual. So what might then be decolonial listening? Decolonization as we know it is an active verb. It's a verb, not a metaphor. It's a present process that can echo into the future. I think one way to begin this, one way, is to bring people to this place and to first listen to those who are here. Freeing the voices that have been wedged beneath dominant history can redress some of the violence that has reduced Indigenous peoples, Indigenous lives, to numbers, to ciphers, to fragments of discourse. But I think it's in dwelling in these fragments, by spending time in the discomfort of the incomplete and listening to the shards that oftentimes stand in for history, that it's possible to attune our ears to something else of these stifled voices. The politics of colonial entanglement offer the possibility not only to hear, but to listen to their silences as well. We're interested in how ceremonies can create rupture, how songs can establish presence, how they might change the course of the future, Thinking again of noise as potential and also the ability to trust our instincts and to trust confusion more. We might come together in this feeling that sometimes feels like homelessness to reimagine this future, to learn more from improvisation. Improvisation was at the heart of many of our resistance movements. And it can be a place where all songs are welcome and all rhythms are accepted. An important part of decolonization, I think, is also refusal. We refuse to be the broken part. This is a series of remarks that's predicated on recovering fragments of speech, of sound, 
of tuning our ears to the voices that sometimes are drowned beneath the colonial din. Indigenous and colonial histories are simultaneously known and unknown, and they hover at times at the threshold of the audible. I am listening, and this is what I am hearing. I think these words are also a reminder that it is time to reclaim something of the wildness that so threatened the newcomers, to uncivilize in order to unleash the potential in other systems, perhaps a kind of savage philosophy, in indigenous social contracts as well, and native understandings of reciprocity or healing. This impetus isn't just about reclaiming land, reclaiming language and reclaiming culture, although that can be part of it. It's also about augmenting all those things that they found so threatening in us. It's about reclaiming that is admittedly rife with colonial entanglements and while it might not be possible to unsnarl each knot that now binds us, it might be possible to separate off a few threads, to cut them, maybe to begin weaving something else from these new narratives and from indigenous experiences of empire and early capitalism. Such an act is perhaps a decolonial and a de-imperial one, because as the scholar Chris Green remarks, before decolonization can be put into practice, de-imperialism must have already begun. I'm always looking for new instruments to use in my compositions. Exactly four years ago, it was after Trump was elected. Uh, I was trying to understand what was happening. I was following Facebook and actually getting tired of, of uh, being on there. I couldn't, I couldn't decipher even for my friends what was truth and what wasn't. So I decided to uh, delete myself from that program. It didn't work, obviously, I'm still on it, but, uh, but I did take a break. And part of that break was to go uh, up to the Standing Rock Water Protector Camp, which was happening that same fall, four years ago. I was invited by my friend and collaborator, Chinupa Hanska Luger, who's an artist who's from that, that reservation. And uh, he was going back and forth to make trips to take supplies and go visit his family and just assess the situation. And because I was hearing all of this noise, all of this misinformation, things I couldn't tell if it was truth or, or fiction, I decided to go up there on my own and see exactly what was happening. But in addition to that, I guess I had my own other reasons. At the same time, Post Commodity was working on a project, Post Commodity being the collective I was a part of for 10 years. Uh, we were working on a project for Documento uh, 13, 14, Documento 14, and uh, we were using, we were interested in using LRADs, long range acoustic devices, as the uh, instrument for our sound installation. So as you can see here, this is a photo of the Standing Rock Ocheti Shakoin Water Protector Camp, and this was in the final days of the, of the gathering when the DAPL security and police forces uh, tried to get the water protectors off of this hill. And as you see here, uh, there is a LRAD aimed at the people on the top of the hill. 
And eventually we did this, we made this installation. What it is, is a piece called the Ears Between Worlds Are Always Speaking, which is two LRADs aimed at the site of Aristotle's Lyceum in Athens, Greece, a site of learning, uh, and more specifically peripatetic learning where Aristotle and his students would walk in this site, in this path, and this is where they would conduct their, their lessons. Our installation uses these LRADs to emit narratives and songs of refugees and migrants traversing the Mediterranean and traversing the borderlands of the US and Mexico and being able to relay their stories and songs through these LRAD devices. So obviously we subverted what is a vi very violent uh, instrument of silencing, of deafening, uh, an uh, instrument and weapon that can make your ears bleed. We decided to use this as a means of communication, of having uh, it be an instrument of storytelling and of being able to not only relay the stories of these scholars who are traversing the land, but of also seeing that these migrants and these refugees are also relaying stories of the lands they come from. And so I spent time there and mostly to uh, see if I would get an LRAD turned on me, but also uh, to try to figure out what was happening with the pipeline and the community there that was gathering to protect this pipeline. And oftentimes when I'm traveling, I carry a small recording device in my pocket just to see whatever I can capture. And so that was another part of uh, my experience there was to uh, record what was happening at the camp, to uh, listen, listen to the singing that was happening, listen to the anger of the water protectors towards the DAPL security. And what I found most interesting was the things that I captured were not, uh, you know, this anger or this singing or this coming together, but were the instances of silence, the moments of praying, the moments of rest, and even the moments where silence was used as protest to counter the, the loudness of the DAPL security. And I'll share one of these recordings here with you now. Reported on Thanksgiving Day.
So I have hours of these recordings that I'm still going through and analyzing and listening and trying to remember who the participants were at this camp, what the dynamics were of the camp and, and the uh, water protector community. And this has led to a lot of discussions with Chanupa and also Candice. And this has turned into this newest work that Candice and I have developed called Dispatch. Dispatch one, the call. This rock is under threat. We need to gather here to protect it. Our actions begin and end at this place. Players for this score, hosts, spiritual leaders, frontline activists, native and non, militant indigenous people, narcs or undercover cops, helpers, witnesses, artists, gatekeepers, temporary campers, sympathizers, Dispatch to the gathering. Rocks have harmonics, resonant frequencies. They're also deities. Lives begun millions of years ago, witnesses to the formation of the earth. They can pick up the tremors of extractive colonialism, exposing wide caverns that lead to trails deep inside the ground, generating sludge and slurry releasing poisons meant to stay undisturbed. The time is now to protect these rocks as though it is a last stand. Our gathering can open up the way to other worlds, those of our own making. These other worlds are not decolonial ones, but non-colonial ones, not bound by their frameworks, but by, but by ours. Heeding this call is the first action. In this action, we come together in person or at a distance to open up a portal of shared experiences. Prompts, set one. Choose one or more prompts to follow. Consider the prompts as protocols of relation, of listening, of action, of witnessing, of performing. Schematic one, which I'll show in a second, can be used as an aid in engaging with others in the camp. Heed the call. Hosts determine points of reference. If you are not already there, arrive. Gatekeepers welcome and relay protocols of place. You can do nothing. You could listen. You could listen beyond to your immediate surroundings, to the land or water, to sounds outside of your normal range even. Sustain yourself. Don't be in the way, don't encroach. At the same time, be useful, observe, introduce yourself unintrusively, deliver supplies, find your place, determine your role humbly. Broadcast outward for any player at any time. Also determine what is not to be shared. Create a small gathering, five people or less for one activity. Do something, cook, pray, sing, teach a game, tell a joke, if necessary, initiate a larger gathering. Witness, 
relay what you learned, translate a broadcast for other listeners, consider different languages, different tones. So this score can be realized as a performance or as a series of imagined events. It can also be enacted in the real world. The players, the prompts, and the schematics are derived from an analysis of the dynamics in the organization of the water protectors in defense of Standing Rock during the no DAPL movement. Not glossing over miscommunication, profiteering, and injustices. In an increasingly fractured society, new paths and new formations are needed to refocus our attention in an attempt to find truth. Participating in this score might produce sonic or visual artifacts. These are as important as the actions. Dispatch number three, the aim. After realizing the prompts in set one, consider the following. What does the land need? What do the hosts want? Do you belong here? Who do you look for or who do you look to for guidance? What are your skills or strengths? What are the threats? Who do you trust? What are you willing to risk? Who's in charge? And what's the model of leadership? And finally, how do we maintain focus? Prompts set two. Choose one path to get back to the rock with clear aim. Do not waver. Schematic two, which I'll show in a bit, can be used as an aid to trace six possible paths back to the rock. These are, establish the protocols necessary for the next defense, amplify the call, gather the players, new or existing, establish their roles, determine the parameters of allyship with people, with the land, move to another site needing protection, continue your actions here, or together define your actions, maintaining the camp, defending the rock, and so on. In 2016, a delegation of five women, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, Waste Win Young, Tara Huska, Autumn Chacon, and Michelle Cook, on behalf of water protectors during No DAPL, continued their activism elsewhere as a way to further erode the links between extractive colonialism and capitalism. By uncovering the funders of the pipeline, and this included banks and private corporations, they made a public call for them to divest. In March 2017, they traveled to Norway and Switzerland to meet with banking personnel to explain how their investments were directly impacting the lives of American Indian people, particularly women and children, polluting water and degrading land in a violation of indigenous rights. The Norwegian bank DNB decided to completely divest. Others have yet to heed their call. And so this is an ongoing project. It started as a bit of speculative fiction, uh, but also overlaps in its function as a, as a score. And while it exists on paper right now, we, our next step is to have these enacted as performances and to see how they would work in such a situation of, of the next gathering, whatever that might be. 
already when we were writing this, there was um, an encroachment in Australia that was the uh, a tree, a very old tree that was cut down, unfortunately, sacred tree. For the expansion of a highway. For the expansion of, yeah, the highway near Sydney, I believe. And there's ongoing uh, sites of conflict. Of course, the US-Mexico border that I spoke of before is always uh, at risk of encroachment from uh, not only man-made structures, Trump's wall, but uh, vigilantes and other kinds of uh, characters down there on the border. Um, so uh, ultimately, uh, this also began as um, as an attempt, uh, uh, maybe a maybe a series of processes to to find some kind of truth amongst the noise, to avoid speaking to the choir, which we are all guilty of doing sometimes, and. Um, and, and really just trying to deep listen in a way that we uh, might not know we were able to do before. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we are interested in is the fact that uh, the way that deep listening had been framed, I think in, within music was as a kind of privilege, um, also as something that, that takes place in sort of potentially like quiet nature places or in nature, but what does it mean to listen when you're often uh, under duress or, or whether you're under direct attack? What do you do then? And one of the things that we talked about a lot was a kind of analysis of the formation of uh, movements like Standing Rock, thinking about analyzing who exactly the players were. Is it as important, you know, is the narc's role as important as, you know, the mil the frontline kind of activists, do they all need to be there in order to create um, something like what happened with, with Standing Rock? And another question that we had too is, what compels people to go in the first place? We, like what, what was that kind of um, tipping point, I guess? Is it possible to manufacture tipping points or not? Um, is it possible to create tipping points through scores? I don't know. And also to consider, uh, a very long history of listening, of being able to listen, to retain that information, and then to continue to relay that as an oral tradition uh, outside of the normal uh, means of communication that we are currently using, which is social media uh, and other kinds of communications. Mm -hmm. So I think we're open to any questions uh, that we can get either in the uh, Q&A or the chat and um, maybe Dina can relay those to us if they come through YouTube. Yeah. While we're waiting, uh, one thing that I thought might be useful to, to describe, Raven, is um, you talked briefly about how silence was used at DAPL, but you didn't necessarily go into the one action that certainly has inspired me and uh, was also on our minds as we were making the score. So I wondered if maybe you wanted to describe that. Yes. Um, I mean, the, the last thing I wanted to do there with this field recorder in my pocket was be another journalist or documentarian uh, sticking it in a camera or recording device in somebody's face, especially when they're singing you know, beautiful song, or or even if they're you know if they're praying, that would be the last thing I would want to do. But we did see that while while there. Um, so the the recording device was very stealth, and it was turned off if I felt uh, I should turn it off. But uh, in the in the week I was there, uh, it was a lot of actions and a lot of protests to this the encroaching security. And that recording I played took place on Thanksgiving Day as water protectors were trying to take over uh, what was called Turtle Hill. On the other side of that hill was where the pipeline was being built. And so you heard a lot of back and forth between the, um, the, the police and the water protectors. And so this, this week, I mean, this was months and months of everybody screaming their lungs out to um, express their anger at the, at the encroachers. One of the most powerful things I saw was a few days after Thanksgiving, there was the uh, the highway that uh, goes north up into North Dakota, and uh, it had been blocked off by the police, barricaded, so that uh, people could not, couldn't go back and forth on that highway. Uh, there was an action led by the eldest uh, women of the camp, all from different tribes, to walk 
across that bridge and right up to the barricade confront the DAPL security and do nothing but just stare at them in absolute silence. So one of these recordings that I have is a recording of nothing, but you can feel that there's 500 people there staring at the police. One of the things that I think I was thinking about when Raven shared that recording and, and that action is there's a kind of usual tone and tenor uh, to activism or there's a presumed one. And that presumed one um, relies oftentimes on people continually starting to raise their voices so that it's matched. Um, but I think in this moment of silence, they didn't really know what to do. And the women through their bodies by coming to the center of the bridge, which was the only middle ground between them, created a kind of irrevocable presence. And I think in that moment, they created a really important interruption as well, and perhaps even some confusion. And I think that these interruptions are really important because that might be in the interruption, you know, the only space of reflection. So we have a question. Um, when you were thinking of the roles and actions, did you find that you were assigning the roles in real time while observing and recording? Or was it more while looking back on your experiences and revisiting the recordings? Well, it, it happened as in both ways. Uh, while I was there, I was a bit taken aback by the amount of diverse folks that were there. I mean, you had anything from, like I said before, journalists and documentary filmmakers, uh, which on one hand were one way of communicating to the rest of the world what was happening at the camp. But on the other hand, also appeared to be encroaching in some ways as well and there for their own gains. Um, you also saw the Burning Man type folks, you know, hanging out. Um, they were just there to be there. But I guess on one hand, they did contribute to the numbers to bring attention to this, mm -hmm. this event. Uh, you saw a wide spectrum of indigenous people. You saw people there even cordoning themselves off and not interacting with other folks. These were putting not, up fences. Putting up <laughs> fences inside of fences, inside of a reservation which seemed insane to me. Um, but these, I guess I would classify as the more kind of militant folks uh, who uh, maybe even a younger generation who I very much understand that anger, but I, I, I can't fully understand what they were doing there. Um, uh, it, so, so a full, uh, I mean, I could go on and on and, and I'm still analyzing this through the recordings, but um, quite profound to see how all of this was functioning and all of the dynamic within the camp. And my, as a composer, my, my best way to start to think about it is, is sonically and see how these, these messages can, can be relayed or be carried or be amplified. Hmm. We have a, a question here regarding, well, we have a couple questions, but maybe we'll, we'll go to this one first. Um, Regarding our thoughts on recording as memory, documentary, art, performance, and score as the same. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I'm interested in, in ambiguous sounds or sounds that take a while to understand their complexity. In the clip I played earlier in the presentation, and I hope it came through, Zoom is weird with you know sharing audio, but um, what you hear is a drone or even two drones possibly uh, flying around. And the first instant, you know, the first, I guess, presumption is, is that these might be the cops, you know, with their drones, but it's actually uh, this Navajo water protector who had his own drones for counter surveillance which I thought was beautiful to be able to see where the, the cops are. Um, so this, these kinds of, this kind of ambiguous sound is interesting to me. And so as memory, uh, that's a good question because is it, is it going to, to uncover some truth or is it going to complicate the matter? And I suppose with this particular project, I'm interested in trying to, trying to find some kind of truth if that mm -hmm. exists in this. Well, and I think the interesting thing about the drone and that in that case is that it's also just its very being or the idea that it can be recording on behalf of the water protectors sort of cha might change some dynamics. Now,
not necessarily that you're going to look or keep those recordings themselves, but just, you know, that you always have that kind of eye, that kind of other, other form of surveillance. Um, I think your idea of performances and scores is potentially kind of existing in that realm too as memory or documentary is interesting. Like I think um, in a way that that's the way the score was developed was out of um, not only kind of memories of, of this event, but also speaking to, we, we talked to a lot of people who have spent time there, including um, Autumn Chacon, Raven's sister, who was there for three months um, and talking to them about their recollections. And so I think it's always interesting framing something based on recollections, especially when you're framing it in the way of a score, which is intended to produce, you know, free feature action, so. And there's another question. Could you talk more about tipping points? Yeah, I was referring to tipping points just in terms of, you know, my interest in, you know, what what was the point at which everyone decided they needed to go to Standing Rock? You know, what what produced that? Um, what was the point, you know, where even movements like Idol No More, which I've referenced quite a bit because I'm interested in the way that um, song was used as part of that movement, which was a movement that was started in Canada in late 2012, continuing through 2013, where oftentimes, and it was started by four women, where uh, they would occupy um, shopping malls, actually. So places of public commerce and sing, uh, bring drums, sing, and there'd be round dances. And that started kind of modestly, I would say, and then grew incredibly quickly uh, where everyone joined in. I think in part what contributed to the tipping point was that so song and the dance were shared language. So people really felt like they could all participate. But I don't know, Raven, if you have other ideas of what you think the tipping points are, or we've got another question here too. I mean, briefly, it, it was yeah. similar. It was it was a critical mass on social media, whether it was accurately relaying what was happening there or it was fictionalized or exaggerated. Um, somewhere in there, people at least became aware that this was an event. And then for people to actually show up, that's where this score uh, kind of kind of shows where there's a lot of different motivations for those who ended up there. Hmm. Now we have a kind of technical question coming from Anthony Huberman, um, asking us to speak a bit more about the score and the differences that we see between a score that is a set of instructions meant to be performed and the graphic score as in an abstract set of instructions meant to be interpreted. Um, which might also apply beyond the realm of music. Perhaps how this relates to your thoughts about abstraction and its political potential. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I believe the power of uh, graphic scores can be in their openness or their ability to, to allow for multiple interpretations. And I think with this, we were, um, we, we were trying to make the score function both as a, a transcription, but also a prescription. So um, trying to understand what these different modes of communication were that I experienced or that Candace and I have been speaking about as, as being these dynamics that are present in these situations, um, but at the same time, trying to turn them back into, into uh, performative prompts. So, uh, but the abstraction, uh, I, I would have to try to think of maybe the, um, maybe the fluidity of the players. I think there's some, there's some, there's some ability there to, to be able to, to make the score into another kind of dynamic, uh, maybe theater or, or mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think through that one. Of of what's what's malleable within the score, or what what is the thing that I, I um, we haven't put into it yet? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in saying that, I think that you know much that exists when this within the score obviously is kind of propositional, um, but other things I think we're we're very serious about those aspects being realized. Mm. 
someone's wondering, uh, once we're, be, we're able to stage the action or stage the performance, uh, how do we imagine documenting it, the action and the performance? Well, we, we're going to begin this, this next series of enacting these as part of Chinupa's, uh, Chinupa Hanska Luger's project settlement, which uh, to go on a little bit about that project, he was going to start a colony at Plymouth, UK this summer on the, uh, what was the 400th anniversary of Plymouth Rock. Um, like a kind of active reverse colonization. He was going to take a bunch of native artists to go live at Plymouth, but of course, COVID shut that down. Um, so he is doing these online uh, projects. And so we are going to first ask people who have engaged in similar kinds of, um, you know, events and actions, some people who were at Standing Rock, mm -hmm. to, to try to envision scenarios uh, of, of performance of this. So maybe that's where the abstraction is also is, is that can take on a number of forms or be uh, replicated by any kind of interaction really. And we're interested in seeing what happens when, when somebody does become another, you know, one of these players that we've, we've mm -hmm. identified within the score. Mm -hmm. But we're also interested in seeing what would happen if this kind of analysis uh, or, or, re-performance were to take place in a place of, of serious conflict. Uh, we're not saying we have a solution for, for organization or anything like that or activism, but, but rather to, to try to understand all the people that are speaking at once mm -hmm. and listen to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I was having a conversation uh, with a sound artist who was actually from Melbourne and we were saying that we were intended to go there kind of in person to to work on this project and and they were say, relaying to me they, that was the first time i had heard about um this kind of stand that had been made around these very old trees that were going to be raised um for the expansion of a highway and the thing that they said to me was well the trouble we have is that the people are still there but no one's paying attention to them anymore so there were Indigenous activists who, who were there. And I think that one of the questions I had in, in thinking through the score was a question of focus. Um, what does it mean to focus, especially now? Uh, how do we kind of keep our attention on these things, especially when it concerns, you know, rocks or trees or the land that don't necessarily speak up in the way that we speak up? So I was thinking that, you know, you can take, you can kind of understand the score as, you know, you can take small parts of it and enact those parts potentially. And I think one of the next things we were thinking about was, you know, what, what do we do when we not only uh, share this with people who were there, but share this with other musicians? How do they interpret it as well? Because I think, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm still interested in what might be considered these sonic artifacts. And we shared some of those too. Another. Oh, just a comment. Thank just you, comment. Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candice and Raven. That was wonderful. It's absolutely. It's always such a pleasure to hear you speak about your work. And hopefully, we can have you back at the lab at some point soon <laughs> in person. So, absolutely wonderful are there any final thoughts or or ideas you want to head out on have you used up all your words <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess uh keep a look out on uh the settlement i think it's settlement.uk settlement uk yeah, dot something the project's called Settlement UK by <laughs> Chinupa Hanska Luger, and he's gathering, um, I think, up to 20 Indigenous artists to do projects uh, in their medium, but on a, on a variety of topics. So, again, my sister Autumn Chacon, I think, is doing a, a project um, maybe related to, to this divestment work that she was doing, and we will be continuing this dispatch project and documenting uh, performances or thoughts or um, other kinds of transcriptions and, mm -hmm. and post them up there. Mm -hmm.
Exciting. Settlement.uk. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time for joining us. It's been wonderful. Thank Thanks for hosting us. It was a real pleasure. And thank you to all of you who listened tonight. Oh, great. Thank you. Have a good night.